Hi there, I'm Felix Clock, and I this is the third episode of how to uh, get started contributing to the Rust compiler. I want to uh, spend this session talking a little bit about tests and about issues. Namely, I want to show you how you can uh, take an issue that's been uh, filed by someone else and work on first narrowing it down into a minimal, complete, verifiable example, and then how to take that example and turn it into a test that you can then include in the regression test of the uh, Rust C's test suite. So first, I'm going to dive into the act of minimization. And I'm going to use this uh, reproduction, this, this ice that someone filed about two weeks ago, and uh, see if I can recreate the problem and then show you how to reduce it down to something smaller. They've already done a fair amount of reduction, it seems like here, or at least this might be a minimal reproduction. I'm not sure yet. But even here, uh, in doing this, you'll see that there's things that we might be able to have success doing further minimization, which we'll get into in a moment. First, uh, the first thing I want to try here is the simplest thing of just saying, look, let's create. I always like to start with a directory dedicated to um, the work I'm investigating. And then the approaches we could use here are either to, um, oh, and the other, the other thing you want to do is you want to make sure you use the versions of Rust that this person says they were able to reproduce it on. In this case, it sounds like this person would have success reproducing it on very recent versions of the compiler. So there might be not that much digging we have to do here, but still it's good to have the versions ready to go. So for that purpose, uh, you can use the Rust up tool to download the versions of Rust that you would need to recreate the problem. So Rust Up is this tool where you can have many versions of Rust installed, and there's one default one. So there's a wrap, there's wrappers around each of the tools that are installed in uh, Doc Cargo, the Doc Cargo subdirectory, and uh, the what the tool does with the wrapper is it dispatches the different versions of the Rust compiler. So if I say Rust Up Show, it'll say the version that's the, the default right now is this nightly one six eight nightly which roughly matches what this person says they're using, except they are using both the cargo from 166 and the uh, Rusty Nightly from uh, December 29th, just to you know really try to recreate the experience that I would hope some people follow. And, and what, the experience you have to use in some situations, you could just start from the newest Nightly, or you could say, let's see, let's try to start by recreating the problem at the time when this person filed the bug. And to do that, you need to choose one of the versions that they said they found the problem on. Um, you might think that the answer for doing that is to say Rust up update nightly 2022 1229. I'm going to let that run, and then I'm going to tell you why it's not quite the right thing. It's not exactly right. It's close. It's, it's got a fence post error in it. The essential problem here is that when you say I want to grab um, the nightly that corresponds to this printout, if you just look at this date and use that, the problem that happens is that when you then go to verify this, you know, if, you, if you don't verify it, then you'll just be slightly off. If you do verify, you discover something interesting. When you check the version number of the thing you just downloaded, it doesn't match. It says it's a different commit. Why is it a different commit? Because it's from a different date. It's actually from 1228. The issue here is that the nightly builds are grabbed right after midnight, which means that they, come, they grab a commit that's from the previous day. It's from the end of the previous day, which means that when you see these version tags, if you want to grab the corresponding nightly, what you should actually do is grab the nightly from the next day. You should add one to the number, um, you know, and, and roll over the next month if necessary. So if I grab the nightly from December 30th, then this should correspond to the nightly that this person was testing on over here. And let's just check that now. So if I say I want to run against nightly and um, I want to know the version of that nightly. Now it'll spit out the exact same information that this person started with over here. Great. So now we have access to the same version of Rust and Cargo that was used at the time when this person was found their bug. If we say Cargo plus nightly version, it'll say the same thing here, except it's a different commit. Obviously, it's Cargo is a different project, but the, the dates are, I think, the, what, the right things here in terms of what Rust up does, I believe. Um, so let's go ahead and try to, there's two different things we can do here. We can either grab their ready-made repository and check that out. Um, and you know what, I, that's one way to go. But the other way to go is to say, you know what, let's 
it's very often people don't actually take the time to make a ready-made repository. So I'm first going to do the steps that I would normally do um, in the common case where someone hasn't actually told me what the version number is, in which case I have to create a crate of some kind. Um, and in this case, this person named their thing rice ice, ice double panic reproduction. All right, so let's, we'll call it something a little bit more. Um, I'll call it this, but, or ice 106.298. So that's the cargo the project that I'm creating. And I'm going to go into that project. I'm going to tell it, okay, I want to have a dependency on the from variance crate. And then I want to have a main that looks like this. In fact, it's a lib crate, not a um, binary one. So I have to, I'm gonna go ahead and delete this. I could do it by, I could fix it by hand, but I don't feel like doing that. Uh, lib, not library. Okay. So we want to get the from variance crate. And we want to get the lib file they have. We want to copy in this definition. And let's see what happens. It may not work off the bat. Um, you know what? Let's get rid of all the other code. Let's see what happens when we just try to build this. So we're inside of ice 106298 and then we're going to say cargo build and it's going to download some stuff that's totally normal for cargo because it's we have this from variance crate that we're depending on and it says there's some problem unsupported state tuple but it didn't give an ice so let's go with cargo check now instead see if that's part of the reason that this nope again didn't fail so something happened here it's possible that the, the from variance crate may have changed in some way um, in the time since this. Let's go ahead and grab the, uh, the ready-made reduction. So this is where, you know, if you don't see the problem reproduce and you were lucky enough that someone gave you a reproduction that importantly has a cargo.lock in it, awesome. Let's go ahead and grab that reproduction and instead use that. I'm just pointing out here that sometimes, you know, attempts to reproduce things hit failures. And um, that's, that's you know, something you have to deal with sometimes. So now I'm in here. I've, I've checked out their, their code. I'm doing cargo check. And it's against the code that they stood at the, as it stood at the time when they ran their thing. And thread panicked while panicking, aborting. This is the bug that they said happened. Great. So we have now recreated the problem at the time when... Um, this thing occurred. So my guess is something's happened since the bug was filed and today that's caused the problem to go away and then not something that's on the Rust side, but it's me something in one of the dependencies. For example, if I take the cargo.lock file from, it's not the only possibility. There are other possibilities like the name of the file matters so the name of the directory that holds it matters, but I'm guessing that's not the issue. I'm guessing that what really happened here is that there's some difference in these lock files that'll make it clear um, that there was an update. See, from variance had an update from 100 to 101. And so when I did my build on my local creation, it grabbed the newer version of from variance. It seems like it sidestepped the problem, okay? So this is good in that people shouldn't encounter this problem um, when they themselves try to use from variance, but there's still a bug here, I think, in that, well, it's possible that the intent should be that this thing should not fail in the manner described and that this is a problem that is still within the compiler itself, or it's possible it's a problem that is solely within from variance um, and that isn't a compiler bug at all. Because, But it is a panic while panicking. I think there's question marks here. So there's steps we can do to further try to narrow this. Now that we've recreated, we've recreated the problem. That's the most important thing um for our, you know us to make progress here so now the question is what next we have this file that's pretty small right and the question is what can we do to uh further narrow this down in terms of what the actual problem was and these steps could include for example 
we don't know where the panic came from. And if we just do build, like doing check versus build, it's still gonna have a, a, a problem that fires. And if we say build verbose, it'll tell us what was running um, at the time when it panicked. Is this Rust C call here, okay. So what I wanna know is for example, how far did it get um, with this problem? Is this a problem in expansion or is this a problem uh, after expansion? My guess, it's hard to know, but it's, my guess is that it's a problem from the procedural macro itself, but I don't know that whatever I'm because we, this, this thing here from variance is a procedural macro within Rust. <coughs> so the step I would use at this point is to say, look, this Rust C call is failing. Let's grab it. Um, so this is the call it's failing. We have to be careful here in that we need to indicate the version of Rust <coughs> that corresponds to the one we're testing, which is um, nightly from December 30th. But we run it and we still get a, a panic, right? We run this Rust C call <coughs> and we get a, a, a panic while panicking. So now what do we do? Well, uh, we can still make some steps here. Uh, for example, this is a nightly compiler, so we can do things like, say, expand the code. And look at that. Even when I say I'm pretty expanded, we still get a panic while panicking, which to me indicates that this is something that's failing during the actual expansion process. Um, if you just do unpretty, what is it called? Unpretty uh, normal this will print out stuff. Namely, this prints out. I know it's hard to read because my terminal right now is uh, printing out my command line as well as the command I'm running. So let me make this a little bit easier um, by echoing and then printing out. So this is the point. It's doing an unpretty normal. That runs successfully. But as soon as I try to run the expansion, it fails. So this is a problem that's coming from running from the macro expander itself. It may well be that the ice is happening within, or the, sorry, maybe it'll be that the panic is happening from within the procedural macro itself, which is what this person actually says here. In which case, um, the question now is, okay, is this something that we should be doing a better job of signaling in some way? <clears throat> because right now you get very bad feedback from the compiler when a procedural macro fails like this. Uh, yeah. And you can't really narrow this test down further because um, other than to make a standalone test with a procedural macro that doesn't depend on this other crate, which would probably be a good idea actually, because obviously someone who tries to recreate this problem off the, like um, just from the thing listed here, isn't gonna do it. They are gonna need to use the, the one that's from this GitHub repository and you know, a better, another answer here is say, let's create our own standalone test that demonstrates what happens when you have a, a procedural macro that panics. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Let's jump into the question of what would a test look like for a procedural macro. And we already have existing tests for procedural macros. Um, I think they live in the UI tests, like many of our tests here. So if you look inside of, I'm inside of the tests directory, and then the UI subdirectory of that, where we keep all of our user user interface tests for the compiler. Uh, if you're not familiar with this directory layout, the essential idea is that the test suite consists of a bunch of different subdirectories. Like we have a directory dedicated to the incremental tests. We have a directory dedicated to the tests of our debug info that we emit for debugger support. Um, we have some tests that are built using make files because of some complex uh, interdependencies with other libraries or like multi-crate scenarios that you need to pass certain flags along in. But the vast, vast majority of our test suite lives in UI. Uh, to make this totally clear, um, it is, um, I'm realizing I should have renamed this buffer. Um, <clears throat> the uh, setup UI test is, Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, I'm trying to remember the best way to actually find this. 
uh, in terms of like I think the easiest thing to do is just do it to you on the uh, stuff in here, and you can see that in terms of the space usage, <laughs> these are all on the order of uh, you know a hundred k, few hundreds of k, or a few or, or you know single digits of k, maybe a few megabytes in cases, and then the UI test suite is a hundred megabytes. That gives you some perspective on like orders of magnitude difference in how big the, the directories are. And it's because the UI test suite has so many more tests, so many more tests broken into subdirectories of their own. It's a huge amount of stuff. And the procedural macros have their own set of tests within here. In particular, if you look, we've got a whole bunch of procedural macros in here, um, various names and whatnot. And the essential idea Let's just start with the very first one. Uh, the, the, make, the breakup of a test like this, procedural macros are interesting because they inherently have a dependence on an external crate, I'm the, namely the crate that defines the procedural macro that is used inside of the test. I already mentioned that we have the run make test suite for the complicated cases that involve multiple crates in some way. Uh, I think like, for example, if you look and run make full depths, there's a bunch of things that have stuff like, what's a good example here? Like different variations on uh, dilibs and rlibs and whether you wanna have a C, C code, C code that links to a Rust code, right? And that's the kind of thing where you really need a make file to describe. The easiest thing to do here is to describe it with a make file. It says, um, compile the C code and compile the Rust code and link them together in some way and run the resulting binary. And that's what this run make test, the run make test suite is all about, trying to make it easier to write tests that with those kinds of complex dependencies. But the reality is people don't want to write make files. Even if you try to make a bunch of tooling to tooling of the form of this helper make file that does a, uh, it's a bunch of helper procedures and whatnot. The reality is it's not fun to write make files. They are not a great experience. And so the better answer is to have facilities in our compiler test suite that enable the most common patterns to be expressed easily without using make files. Procedure macros are an example of this. And so the whole proc macro test suite has directives. There's often all of our tests, most of our tests rather, have directives in the form of certain kinds of comments in the file that indicate what kind of test it is. So uh, the kinds of tests include uh, compile tests are expected to fail at compile time with some sort of known error or tests that are supposed to pass at compile time and then run. And so that's what run pass means. It's a test we expect to compile successfully and run successfully. And then the aux build directive says there's some other file that you need to compile first because it's going to get used as an external crate by this file. What file is it? It's add impl. Now you might notice what add impl are you talking about? We're in the add impl file, right? You might think that this is a recursive reference to the file where it's currently compiling, and not, that's not the case. Aux build, that is a directive, is referring to stuff inside an auxiliary directory. So inside the directory we're in, there is an auxiliary directory. We look inside there, we find the add impl um, directory. We find the add impl file where we now see the definition of a proc macro. So if we want to make a test for this problem, we could start by saying, let's recreate the scenario that this person was having, except maybe make a simpler version of it. So uh, what I am thinking is that it, this all depends on us even deciding that this is a bug that we want to fix in the co compiler, but I think we do. I think we, we should at least strive to have a better experience here. This experience of getting this kind of error due to a panic from a proc macro it's pretty bad. Um, I would at least like some hint that the problem occurred due to a proc macro evaluation. And so that's the kind of thing I would like to fix. Now, in terms of how to write a test for this, if we're doing the test first style development, uh, what I think we can say is, all right, let's make a, a proc macro that is about um, panicking while expanding. Okay. So if we say panic during expand.rs, right? And remember the way that the uh, add impl was written, it had run pass, we won't expect that here. Um, we'll expect some sort of compile fail, I think. We'll expect, we'll need an aux build of the macro definition. 
um, we'll need a, a macro use. This is an old school thing that you don't need to do nowadays with cargo, but if you're not using cargo, which compile test doesn't, then you need to start using things like um, extern, explicit extern create directives and um, macro use directives to give the compiler the right hints to tell it what to do to grab the right information from the right places. And then um, the macro that we'll use is something that's going to be a derived macro that's called panic during expand. Um, panic, right? Something like that. Where the whole point is that, like, this is going to do something bad and we want a better user experience out of it. Um, it doesn't really matter about this create business I expected practice. It can just be any struct. The point is the macro needs to expand, needs to panic in some way in reaction to what's happening, what it, in reaction to what it sees. Um, so we'll just make a struct, maybe with a single field. And let's, uh, I guess I could make a create type lib here just so they won't complain to me about this being a non-binary crate, a, a non-executable, uh, yeah, a non-bin crate, so this is a lib crate. Okay. And now I've written a test of sorts. What happens when I try to run, try to try to compile this test? I bet you can predict something that's going to happen here. Um, so I've already built the compiler. So now I'm going to run the test suite. I'm trying to remember if I say test proc macros, test UI proc macro. Is it proc macro or proc macros? Proc macro. Okay. Test. It's run the test suite. So just, I'm going to have to double check what the syntax is for telling it to run the test suite with um, this particular test. So if I say test, tests UI proc macro, hopefully this will run the thing I'm talking about. And what I'm predicting here, oh, it needs to, you know what, it, it's doing it with a stage, it's building the stage two compiler now because the test suite, I don't know if it needs a stage two compiler for this. Um, let's say test stage one and see if that what happens here. So to be clear, I was trying to be quick before and I was just saying build the compiler at stage one and then I was running the tester without passing the stage one directive and I interpreted that to mean run the testing against stage two and it said to itself, the, 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 the x.py build system said to itself, um, I can't run the test suite yet. I need to build the compiler first for stage two. And look, okay, this is what I was hoping to see actually, a failure, but not a failure like of this, this test is, um, oh, okay, it's, it's panicking because the compile fail failure is actually useless in, in UI tests. Um, so that's not the test, that was not the failure I was expecting to see, but okay, let's fix that, get rid of that directive. And now let's see what happens. So now we get a, now it fails again, and it's not failing because of a panic during a panic or anything like that, it's saying, I couldn't find a source file. In particular, I had that aux build directive to build this other file, and it tried to find that file and compile it, and it couldn't because I never defined that proc macro. So I have to go and make the file for this right here, and I'm going to take I'm going to do some cargo cult um, development here. Where I'm just going to take this stuff off the shelf from what this person wrote for this other test. Uh, now this is going to be the panic macro that I defined. And I don't think the name matters. And I don't think that what it does matters. What matters is just that it panics from within here, I think. Let's see what this. What I want to see now is what happens during this attempt to compile and test. So it runs and oh, it complains now saying that there's two crates with the same name. That's interesting. I wonder what I did wrong there because the other crate I thought had the same pattern of development. Um, 
of having the same name in both cases, but maybe they overrode the, oh, did they override the, um, the name? Well, I'm going to pause here and come back to this in a moment. Okay, where were we? I stopped a moment ago. Um, where we were at was, I was trying to figure out why there was now a crate name conflict that I didn't believe it had occurred with the add info example. Um, it's possible that I misunderstood something, um, like some detail about the naming of these files, but no, the files have the same name. Uh, it's possible that this being a binary and not a library means it gets its name doesn't conflict. It's might get compiled into something that has a different has a name with a dash in it uh, versus the thing that I made is a library. So let's just to isolate that cause of the distinction here, let's try this instead. In particular, what I did there was to change from a, a library crate um, into a binary crate and added a main function. And I'm hoping that might cause this problem to go away with the uh, conflict in the names. Yeah, this is good. Um, but it's also bad because this now actually produces what I expect to see. It's saying that it panicked during proc macro derive. And it's a panic during expression. This is the kind of experience I'm expecting someone to observe. Um, so now the question is, why is the other thing not seeing that kind of behavior? There's two ways to go here. We can either dig more deeply into what the um, original bug was doing um and that is is something we probably could do in particular i'm looking at this person saying that they um fixed this problem in the upstream crate the from variance crate by adding some code that doesn't uh panic anymore in certain cases but i'm still not convinced this derive function here indicates that it just calls unwrap. So I'm not seeing why that would not be like equivalent to what I was doing over in my code, um, where I likewise just called panic during expansion, much the same way, I would say. They have a derive, it calls unwrap. Like if I do, Oh, my panic is says panic during expansion. I wonder if that's, if I'm misleading my own self. Um, no, but this message comes from this. All right, let's try this anyway. Let's try doing none unwrap, right? This is this also is going to cause a panic in a sillier way. If I do this, now it says, yeah, proc macro drive panic. So this is still a reasonable user experience in my opinion compared to what was filed here, um, where it just said panicked while panicking. There must be something happening where this other person's code is actually panicking on a panic, like it does the panic, but something else it's stored is also panicking. And so during this panic call, something else has been stored that causes a panic. Actually, let's, let's try that. Let's store the AST and see what happens if I do that. Oh, well, you need the sin crate um, to do that. I don't want to go and add external crates like that. How did add during add impl handle this? Because what it does is it just grabs, it just creates this thing directly. Um, this may or may not be useful. Let's see. Oh, now it's saying I can't figure out what none means here. Um, true, true. I'm just uh, arbitrarily instantiating the nut, the option type on option of units. 
just to get the code to compile. It's still saying uh, something useful here, as in proc macro derive fanix. Okay, let's, again, I could try to dig manually into the from variance code and figure out why it, it was panicking back at this time with a double panic. And I will do that if I can't figure this out in a more direct way, but I want to try one more thing first. So the whole deal with a panic during panicking is that it's a case where you've got um, some local variable, some, some state that's on the stack, owned by the stack, and then during a panic, where when the panic mode is to unwind the stack in response to panics, we unwind the stack and run the destructors of the stuff that's owned by the stack. So you're already panicking, you're unwinding the stack and running those destructors. If one of those destructors panics, then that's when you have a panic within a panic that often causes an abort. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make something called panic on drop. I'm going to implement drop for panic on drop. What's it going to do during its drop? You can probably guess it's going to panic. Okay, we're going to do that. And we're going to now create, instead of creating this parsed input, because I was hoping the parsed input would somehow create state that would pan, that would un, that wouldn't unwind nicely, but I'm guessing maybe it's part of sin, the sin creates structure that actually is panicking in that way. Um, instead of that, um, let's just create this thing. We're going to create a panic on drop in entity. We're going to bind it locally to this unnamed thing, but not use it. Then we're going to have a panic here. Um, uh, sure. Just reading overly um, thorough here about this. Okay, and now run the test again. And this time, what we see is, oh, well, an error because I didn't get the code right. I was missing an ampersand here. So this was saying it took self by value instead of by reference, and that made the drop not work. Aha, okay. This is now the kind of test that we can use to, um, you know, see a problem here. And yeah, it's interesting whether or not, now can we fix this easily? I don't know yet. Uh, I would have to do some investigation. But the point is we now have a test, a test that fails. And fixing the bug would be something where we would now change this test to be something that succeeds in a nice way. In particular, we'll probably still get a, we'll get a compilation error here. We're always expecting some sort of compilation error, but we're expecting one that's nicer than what this thing is producing. This current error is this standard error thing that is not a good user experience to have. Once we actually fix this bug, and make it something that ex that ex has a nice error, then the response then is to have this. These are all in the UI test suite, and so any test in the UI test suite that's a compile failing test, so it's supposed to fail compile time. For example, this ambiguous built-in attributes test right here. Um, it's supposed to have a set of errors that are known, and there's two ways in which we embed the connect the errors to the source code for all such tests. If we have a compile fail test, then the first thing we need to have is the errors need to be associated with certain line numbers in the file. And that's denoted by having these um, comments of the form, a comment on that line with a tilde and then the word error and the message, uh, just the prefix of the message, some, some pattern that matches the message is basically what goes here. Enough so that someone reading over the test file can say, okay, I can sort of validate that this error makes sense in this context. It's meant to be something for someone reading the test to get an idea of the errors that are expected at a sort of gross level, high level view. But it's not the fine grained user experience testing in terms of knowing what the exact user experience is. To see what the exact user experience is, what you need to look at is the expected standard error output. So in addition to the source file, in this case, ambiguous built-in attributes, right? This this file name right here. There's an associated standard error file where the .rs extension has been replaced with standard error. And this consists of all the output that we expected, the exact output we expect to see 
when I say exact output, I actually mean it's a, it's a normalized output. Um, there's, for example, the, the actual output is going to include full paths to the directories where the source was located, but we can't put that in our repository. My path is going to be different from your path. I'm going to have different file, different um, directory names in the front. So we actually normalize the output via this uh, post pass that takes the output and turns certain things into other things. So this dollar sign dir here is, is a result of normalization where we basically factored out that prefix directory and plugged in dir instead. So there's normalization steps like that that normalize the output and those can be customized per test. So if there's certain outputs that actually occur in different things and different targets, you can normalize those as well and make them things that normalize the same expected value, expected error output here. The whole point being that this file is meant to sort of validate the gross, the, sorry, the overall user experience, the, 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 the nature of what the output looks like for someone trying to read the error output from the compiler. And in this particular case of this pre-existing test, we can see the error output that it's expected, namely um, an error on line 34, an error on line 9, an error on line 6. It looks like these things here. And you'll notice that if we go to the original file again and go to line 34, we see the error, expected error here. There's, there's, the system is going to ensure there's a kind of consistency here where the compile test suite is going to both ensure that the test suite has, the test code itself, the test source code has these error annotations, one of them for every single error that's output, and likewise one for every warning that's output. Every, basically every bit of diagnostic, it's gonna say, correlate that with the exact line number that it's associated with. And in addition to that, in addition to making you say for every single error or other diagnostic warnings, et cetera, um, making you say that in the, embedded in the source code, you also have to write out the full text or the full normalized text that the compiler spits out here. Now that might sound like a lot of work for you to write down all that stuff, but the good news is that the uh, system actually automates the process of creating those, um, those test outputs. In particular, there's a way to bless the tests, um, and I would hope it's documented here, um, let's see, because there's a way to say test and dash dash blessed this thing here, adding new tests. So after you're confident that your test is producing the output you expect, you can run XPY test and pass the dash dash bless output. And in that, instead of what the dash dash bless does is instead of checking the output it generates against the expected error file, it instead will just generate the the normalized output into the expected error file. So it's one of these things where you're only supposed to use this once you're confident you've got it the way you expect it to look. And that's that's the heart of our testing system, basically. That's the big the big picture idea of everything here. And it's documented inside of this, this dev guide where, like I just said, um, you include, the you have the source code and you have the expected error output that you're gonna have, but you also add the annotations saying where the errors are expected to occur. And this is documented more carefully or more, more thoroughly in the error in the error annotation, error annotation section. In particular, the example that we were just looking at a moment ago, um, we are putting the error annotation on the same line, but in general, you can't actually expect to put the error annotations on the same line. The simple, the most easy example of this is if you have two errors for the same line, you can't encode them both in one single comment on that line. So the error annotation section describes how um, this the syntax you can use to basically say, look, I want to associate an error with um, the current line or the previous line. Or in fact, you can it, it's a counting system where you can say, I want to go three lines up with three arrows. And then if you have more errors to add, you can just use this special um, bar here to say, I want to add more errors associated with that line that I just mentioned in the previous line. And the place where you see this happen is cases like this, where you see an arrow going up to that line, and that corresponds to saying, I'm expecting to see for line 24, this output. I'm expecting to see the error wrapper is ambiguous, and I'm also expecting to see the error um, attribute should have been applied to a struct enum or union um, somewhere. Yeah, uh, that's 
interesting. Why don't I see that? I see that up here for line 20. Should be, did I write have been applied? Ah, here we go, yes. So here is an example of where we see for line 24, we see both the error repr is ambiguous and we see the error attribute should, have, should be applied to struct enum or union. Both of those errors are associated with this single line. And so we encode that in the source file with the arrow here that's encoded by a caret and a line. And then the corresponding standard error output file has corresponding errors for both of the errors. They are far away now in the printout, but they are both present. Okay. And with that, I'm ready to stop. I think that's a good session. I obviously, I haven't fixed any bugs yet. Um, in terms of the other problem that I was just looking at a moment ago, right? There's still work to be done there to see about how to fix this double panic example that I was just describing. Um, but we now have a test that we could use to demonstrate this to others. And um, I may actually go to the, I'm gonna go, what the, actually what I'm gonna do is at least so this work doesn't get lost. Um, what I'm gonna do is start from here. Say this is the essay show I was looking at. I'm going to say I, I've created a test suite. Um, or since the from variance crate has been since updated, the problem described here does not duplicate unless you use the cargo dot lock um, first notes um, that is part of the linked repository. In any case, I have I've narrowed the problem down to a simple MCVE. Um, which one can observe by putting the following files into the appropriate locations in the test UI proc, the test UI directory. And I'm going to put down the two files, which are because they're so small and trivial that I'm pretty confident that they are just fine to include um, up here. Is it in fact more complicated than it needs to be? Um, wait, this isn't, oh, interesting. See, we, already, we actually already had a proc macro panic test. The problem is this is a double panic. Um, so my tests aren't named quite right, actually. Let me change the names before I make this final commit of this message. Um, so, what I'm going to do is choose a new file name for this. So this is a double panic. Uh, or you know what? The other one was called proc macro panic, right? No, what was it called? Panic during I panic. Let's look. That's funny. I thought I had ah uh, panic in lib, lib panic in lib proc macro. I see. That was an issue there. Oh, yeah, they yeah, include the issue number. All right, let me include the issue number first of all. So I will um, I'll write this file. It's going to be issue 60629, um, double panic in proc macro. Um, yeah, okay. Or just during expand. Not ah, double panic in proc macro, it's fine. Okay. And I'll now call this double panic during expand. And likewise, the panic during expand file now needs to be called double panic during expand. And hopefully it still be, reproduces the same way. And let that run. Um, uh, no, something's wrong. I didn't fix all the places that need to be fixed. We 
because this is no longer, this is called double panic and expand now. Yeah, okay. So now that I've created those things, oh, I kept the old file around. Let's get rid of the old file too. Um, I call it? Can I call it penetrating expand? Hmm. Well, it doesn't matter. Let's see if there's three pieces. Now we just one test failure. Okay, great. Um, so this is file test UI proc macro auxiliary. Which one should I show first in the, in the explanation? One oh six two nine eight double panic during uh, in talk macro RS and it looks like this. This one looks like this. I could probably simplify this, right? I really want to shorten this file a little bit more. I'm going to be pasting its text directly into that other thing. Do I need token stream? I do need token stream. But I don't need to, to use it though. It still works, but I didn't do anything wrong there. Looks great. Okay. Okay. All right, and we're done. Thank you very much for listening. All right. And I hope to see you at the office hours, which I will include the dates for in the description. Bye.